Text-to-voice synthesis provided by Vidnami. Orientation for newbies. February 24, 2021 by Anna Von writes. So you have discovered the great fraud and figured out that you need to come home to the land and soil jurisdiction where you naturally belong. Congratulations. You've made a wise choice, but whether you know it or not, you are carrying a lot of baggage with you. This isn't your fault. You've been indoctrinated and trained to accept a top-down hierarchy of authority, and as a result, your expectations and assumptions about government and how things work is 180 degrees out of phase with your actual government, in which authority flows in the opposite direction. That is just one major change and adjustment. There are others. You've been given a completely twisted version of history, with more holes in it than an average Swiss cheese. Rewards, respect, and authority in our system of government is given to those who are wisest, kindest, most learned, most motivated to serve, and most honorable. All the hard lessons you learned on the playground and climbing the corporate ladder need to be left behind in favor of an egalitarian vision of self-respect, self-determination, and self-responsibility, freedom, equality, brotherhood, and free will, all of which are the hallmarks of self-governance. Self-governing a country begins first and foremost with governing ourselves. With all this freedom and so many rights to exercise, some newcomers think that someone died and left them in charge of the world. This is not the case. As my mother used to tell me almost daily, your rights end where another person's rights begin. We have not been taught that lesson in public school, in the military, or in the corporate environment, so we all need to learn it now. Reflect upon the meaning and attitude of this logic, I may not agree with what you say, sir, but I shall defend to the death your right to say it. We are all the inheritors of nature and nature's God, all having unalienable rights, and only some of those rights are enumerated in the Bill of Rights. In our world, we all have the right to be idiots, to make mistakes, to insult others, believe horse hooey, and engage in damaging behaviors, but then, as adults, we are also held accountable for these choices. Bad choices catch up to us, usually sooner than later. Anyone who causes disruption, interferes with the ability of the assembly to conduct business, is belligerent and disrespectful, doesn't bother to get on the agenda, indulges in gossip and character assassination, and otherwise feels called to undermine group morale and commandeer the proceedings can be removed by the officers appointed to provide security. You have a birthright and can't be deprived of membership in the state assembly, but you can be kicked out of any single meeting if you persist in causing trouble or obstructing progress. Nobody should be insulted by being presented with a Bevins declaration. Those who are employed by the federal government or the federated state of state government should, generally speaking, be participating in their own district assembly, and while they are welcome as state nationals to attend public meetings of the state assembly and share their opinions about in state issues, they are not eligible to function as state citizens and are not eligible to vote on or influence interstate decision making until they retire or otherwise sever their obligations to the federal government. All our state coordinators function as state nationals on assignment for the Federation. The Federation is not the federal government. The Federation is an instrumentality of the states of the Union combined. As a result, there is no presumption of any conflict of interest owed to a foreign government on the part of our coordinators, but they still do not function as state citizens until they retire from the position of state coordinator or the position naturally sunsets once the entire assembly structure is up and functioning properly. A considerable amount of confusion has surrounded the issue of being a state national versus being a state citizen. State citizens have to be at least 21, have their home firmly established within the borders of their native or adopted State of the Union, have their 1779 declaration recorded, be a member of the Assembly in good standing, and most importantly, have no divided allegiance to any other political entity or government. When it comes to interstate and international affairs, those making decisions for our states cannot be compromised by conflicts of interest. State nationals on the other hand are free of any obligation to the state government except that they are obligated to keep the peace. This means that state nationals enjoy the protection of the state and the enforcement of their constitutional guarantees by the state, and so long as they don't harm anyone else or ruin or steal property belonging to others, they are free to live their lives and enjoy the peace. At first glance many newbies think this means that being a state national is a free ride, all the gravy and none of the responsibility. 
That is precisely the attitude that got us into the mess we are now trying to correct. We left power hungry and greedy men at the helm and we see the results of too many good men and women doing nothing. The present situation is living testimony to the fact that if you want something done right, you need to do it yourself. There's only us chickens here and the work and the responsibility is entirely on us. If you are not pleased with the way things have gone in the past, chalk it up to one thing, you and others like you weren't here, doing your public duty to self-govern. If you think things aren't happening fast enough to suit you, there's the wheel, hamster. For an adult to choose the status of state national usually implies some condition of need. People who are too old or too sick to fully participate, people who have overwhelming burdens at home, people who suffer from mental issues and addictions, people who are working for other governments, and all minors, are owed the status of state nationals, and our protection. Among all the surprises we've had as we assemble and bring the state assemblies into session is the fact that many people no longer have a concept of public meetings, civil discourse, and decorum. Our state assemblies are public bodies, they are not private clubs. Assemblies are not, generally speaking, places to air your private grievances, though there are avenues supported by the assemblies to pursue such grievances. We have recently gained access to the administrative courts which are responsible for providing us with remedy for trespasses and misadministration against us. We are also well on our way to securing commercial remedy for assembly members. Those who are arriving with pre-existing legal issues need to complete a Federation Criminal Incident Report and record it via the Office of the State Recording Secretary as a first step toward redress. Assembly meetings cannot devolve into pity parties or gossip sessions. Always remember that there are 320 million Americans and most of them have a horror story or two or three to share. Also remember that our combined bigger fish to fry are more important than any one misery. We don't need tears and drama. We need proper, practical, determined, and concerted group action. Likewise, there are some who come into our assemblies with the nasty and immature habit of gossiping and causing doubt, disruption, and paranoia. The assemblies are here to accomplish serious and necessary business and it is to the benefit of everyone concerned that we get on with it and establish a united front. We can't do this if we are sniping at each other behind our backs like teenagers in a locker room. If you have any honest concerns or questions, you all know how to get in contact with me. Be direct and expect that I will be direct in return. Always remember that what we are doing is completely lawful, proper, and peaceful. We are restoring our government to its full form and function and there is nobody else that has the right to do that. We've been running on four cylinders since 1860, but that is about to change for the better. You have grown up in a system calling itself a democracy, and in this democracy the majority rules, or is supposed to. However, in our actual government, we maintain Republican states, states. There are rules and definitions, but they all respect free will and the rights of individuals above all else. We are, each one of us, a majority of one. In a democracy there is a definite herd or team mentality, which causes people to attack others who don't agree with them and to be frightened if there isn't a universal agreement in place about everything down to a gnat's eyelash, but in our system of government, everyone is allowed their own opinion, doesn't have to like everything, isn't required to march in step or march at all and they can still be respected and trusted, so long as they do no harm. There may be times when members of an assembly passionately disagree about important issues. You will be tasked to consider many such issues in the days to come, and you all owe it to yourselves and to each other to be alert and observing and thinking hard and logically as you decide issues that will impact you, your family, your future, your state of the union, and the country as a whole. If you just felt a chill go up your spine, good. It's an awe-inspiring responsibility that undergirds all the rights that you are heir to. It's not for the lazy, the ignorant, or the faint of heart, and you may be feeling a bit overwhelmed as you realize, this is for real. Well, yes, it is. This is your government. This is what underlies the American dream. It's your family, friends, and neighbors coming together to decide what happens in your state and your world, and enforcing the public law that you collectively ordain for your protection and the protection of all other Americans. It's a stiff order and I won't sugarcoat it. There's a lot of thankless, hard, picky, work to be done. There are funds to raise. Books to bind. Classes to attend. Plans to be made.
research to delve into, resources to be developed, video courses to create, communications to make, courts to organize and run, peacekeeping duties to attend to, court suits to fight, and the list goes on. Our country and our government has been left adrift and at the mercy of foreign subcontractors for a century and a half. We are like Rip Van Winkle, and everyone has a lot of catching up to do. That said, there is no more important work to do or anything of more crucial potential benefit or loss. This is, in its own way, America's finest hour and the rest of the whole world is waiting and watching to see how we, the purported land of the free and home of the brave, will rise to this occasion, or not. There is in America a great deal of talk about freedom, but upon reflection, most of you already know that you have experienced precious little actual freedom in your lifetimes. This is largely because your government has been in mothballs and your public employees have been running things to suit themselves and their corporate masters. They have slowly, and sometimes not so slowly, usurped upon us until everything is upside down and backwards, the tail is wagging the dog, the employees are telling the employers what to do, and every other modern illness of body, mind, and spirit has accrued. If you want this craziness to end, and you want the freedom you have earned and the money you are owed, welcome home. That's what all the rest of us want, too. Remember that going forward, and you won't need me to tell you what to do. You will quickly learn the simple logic and laws of freedom. Every man and woman is born free and deserves to live and die free. Everyone is responsible for him or herself, for what we think, and what we do. With every right comes a responsibility. Our individual rights end where another's rights begin. Rights and freedoms that are not exercised are moot. When we enslave another, we enslave ourselves. We are responsible for directing those we employ. If we don't like something, it's up to us to change it. If we see an injustice, it's up to us to correct it. If we want peace, it's our duty to keep it. If we are bogged down, it's our job to climb over or dig under. If we cherish our own rights, we must cherish the rights of others. If we cherish our own freedom, we must cherish the freedom of others. And we can never give up or hand over our responsibilities in these respects to anyone else, for the moment we do, we are putting ourselves and everyone else at the mercy of those twisted and maniacal few who willfully live their lives as parasites. These con artists and bag men have proliferated while Americans slept. They've been spinning their tails and redefining everyone and everything to suit themselves, they've registered us as foreign nationals, rewritten history at least a dozen times, taken over our schools, taken over our airwaves, bullied us on the highways we paid for, mortgaged our homes and businesses to pay their debts, passed themselves off as our representatives and wrecked havoc throughout the rest of the world, and all the while, they've been blaming us, their victims, for it. People throughout the world have been taught to blame the Americans when those responsible are actually foreign subcontractors of ours and commercial corporations run amok on our shores. It's time to recoup our tarnished reputation as a country and as a nation. It's time to let fly the big news that it wasn't us causing all the trouble, spending all the money, and bullying everyone inside and outside our borders. As you embark, officially, on this grand enterprise of reclaiming America for Americans, it's time to fully understand that we nearly lost it. What could not be taken from us by force of arms, has been siphoned away by guile, instead. Our enemies have not come from Russia or China. Instead, they've come from Dallas and New York and New Orleans, from LA and Frisco, from Lisbon and Leeds, Brussels and Bern, Rome, and, of course, most of all, from Westminster and the inner city of London. It's our purported friends and allies who have betrayed us, because they are the only ones who could, the ones who had the means, the motive, their unpaid debt to us, the inside track, the trust, and the opportunity to create this entire debacle. And they have betrayed their own people, too. So, face it. Acknowledge where we are and all the mistakes and misconceptions and violations of trust that put us in this position, looking at nearly 160 years of enslavement by our own public employees, occupation by our own army, and all the rest of it. It's daunting to say the least. Nothing is as it should be, nor as our talking heads told us it was. Walter Cronkite lied through his teeth and the only truthful comment he left us was a Saturday Night Live skit in something like 1993. Some people looking at this would tell you that the American dream is dead. Might as well go home, roll a rock over our heads and learn to speak Mandarin. 
But that's not what we believe, here at our state assemblies. We believe that we are the employers of these goats, and we will have our way. The Queen and the Pope and the Lord Mayor will have to pay the piper for what they've done here, to their good friends and supporters, the Americans, the Aussies, the Canadians, too, to the Germans and the Japanese, the Libyans, Syrians, Iraqis, and Palestinians, the Poles and Czechs, the Lebanese, the Croatians, the Bosnians, the Koreans, the Vietnamese, the Indians, the Russians, the French and Italians, the Greeks, the Turks, and almost everyone else, have suffered right along with us, including the entire continent of Africa. It's not us on the run, folks. It's them. So take a good, deep breath, and begin. Bring your own mop and bucket.